All right, let's get started. Uh, welcome to the session on JavaScript, the cute parts. My name is Venkat Subramanyam. We're going to talk about some of the wonderful features in JavaScript, especially in uh, ES6, and uh, uh, some of the things we can actually do a lot better. Well, this time to ask questions or make comments is whenever you have it. If you do have a question or a comment, I request you to start speaking up. I cannot see actually from here because of the lights in front of me. But if you uh, draw my attention, I'll be more than happy to listen to you. So let's talk about just a little bit about the good old JavaScript. You know, I was thinking about how to describe JavaScript as a language. And uh, can you believe it? This is 2018, and we are talking about JavaScript. And so here's my definition of what JavaScript is. It's like that bad villain in the movie. They keep killing him, but he keeps coming back to life. That's how it feels about JavaScript, isn't it? But JavaScript, the old one, was really notorious. But here we're talking about, thankfully, modern JavaScript. Modern JavaScript is a lot better. It's learned a lot of things from a lot of different languages. For example, languages like Ruby and Java and uh, C Sharp and so on, a lot of different languages uh, it's got inspiration from. And there's a lot of number of beautiful features. In fact, I, I never thought I would get actually excited about JavaScript, but honestly, as I started playing with JavaScript, the modern versions, I got pretty excited about it so much that I actually wrote a book on it uh, called the Rediscovering JavaScript. It's in a way that it's really true that it's a rediscovery because it's a language that's been around for 20 plus years, and yet there is so much to really do with it given the changes that the language has gone through over the past uh, you know, a few years. So I want to talk about, about what are the better things we can do, and I want to share with you some of the parts I'm really excited about, what I call as the cute parts, are things that really are making our lives a lot better. So let's talk about a few things that we shouldn't do and we should probably move towards doing. The first is we should really get rid of var in the code. Var is really a bad idea. So for example, if you say var max equal to 1,000, and I want to print the value of max right there, but for reasons I don't understand, you could actually do var 200, and you can print var. What doesn't make sense, any sense here, is that we are redefining the variable one more time. It makes no sense at all to redefine a variable, hiding this particular variable at this point, not a very healthy thing to do. But also, if you continue a little further, let's say we have a function right now. And within the function, I'm going to say, uh, let's say local 1. And the local 1 is equal to, let's say, a value of 7. And I want to print out the value of local 1, as you can see right here. And it printed it. But what I want to do here is to define a block scope. So within this block, I'm going to say local 2 equal to, let's say, a value of 8. And I'm printing local 2. And that worked also. But unfortunately, though, at the time of war, JavaScript really did not have a block scope. So what JavaScript does is it comes along nicely and says, hey, look, I found a little nice little braces and throws it away. It has no meaning at all, unfortunately. So as a result, notice, I'm able to use local2 right outside of the block scope, which is pretty nasty. So these are some of the problems with var. So what do you do with var? So the best thing to suggest is uh, quit using var because this is really not a good idea at all. So moving forward, we should not use var. So what should we do instead? Well, let's get back to this code for a second. Let's say use the let, if you will. I'm going to say max equal to 1,000. Now I'm going to print the value of max. It's 1,000. Now I say let max equal to 200, and I want to print the value of max. Well, that will give an error, as you can see. And the reason is you cannot redefine a variable that's been defined using let. That's a really good news. Similarly, if I have a function called a foo, and in this function, if I were to define let, let's say, uh, uh, local 1 is equal to 7 one more time, and I'm going to print local 1, and I'm calling the function foo, you can see that actually worked. But if I were to put a block scope and say local 2 equals to 8, and I'm printing local 2, and you can see that in this case, if I were to try to access local 2 outside, that would become an error, as you can see. I'm not allowed on line number 10 to access the variable because it's got block scope. So the good news is let has block scope. 
And then, of course, uh, uh, can be redefined as well. So in other words, uh, what, what I'm getting to is uh, quit using var. So quit using var, use let. But having said that, I'm going to change it right away. So uh, don't use let as much as possible. So why not? I'm going to give you an example of why let is not a smartest thing on Earth. Let's take a look at one example real quick. Let's say for a minute I say factor equal to 2 for a minute. Well, that's great. Now I want to say over here print it equal to. And I'm going to take an element, but I'm going to print out right here. Let's go ahead and say, in this case, e times factor. Now, of course, I'm going to call print it, pass a value of 2. And you can see that the value is 4. There's no surprise over there. But I'm going to now go ahead and say factor equal to 0. Now, honestly, I'm going to ask you the question, what do you how many of you think the output is going to be 4? Just a show of hand. Not a single person thinks it's a 4. How many of you think it is 0? A few people raised the hand. Others did not. How many of you think I have no clue? Th absolutely, I'm with you. That's exactly where I am, too. I have no clue. Well, I work with multiple languages. This is way too much than my smartness can help me. And I look at this and I'm like, huh, what's this happening? Well, here's the beautiful thing. I often like to give this as an interview question. And I would give this an interview question and ask the developer, what is the output? If they try to answer the question, I tell them you're fired even before they are hired. Because the right answer is, are you all stupid to write code like this? Then you're hired. Because the point is we want to write code that's easy to work with. This is terrible code. Well, as you can see, the result was uh, zero, but that's really complex. What should we do instead? Well, this is why we want to use a constant instead, because a constant cannot be mutated. Notice in this case, when I try to run the code, I get an error on line number five, saying that line five says, I cannot mutate the variable because it's a constant. So the short answer is, uh, quit using so quit using var. That's the very first thing. Use const wherever uh, possible, and use let only where const is not uh, you know possible. So this should be the really go-to recommendation: is quit using var, use constant wherever possible, and use let only when a constant is not possible. So your go-to should really be to use constant. I would, in fact, say that this is one of the things we should do as a coding standard in Java moving forward, is developers should use const more often and less, uh, use let less often and, and quit using var and, and stay out of that as much as possible. OK, so we talked about the let and the var. The other thing to think about is, in the old syntax, we had arguments. Let's talk about that a little bit. So let's say for a minute, I'm going to say constant max is equal to function. And in this case, I'm going to say a comma b. And all I'm going to do is, if a is greater than b, return a. Otherwise, I'm going to say return b. I'm going to call right now this particular function max. But I'm going to go ahead and call the function max with, let's say, 1 and 2. Clearly, the result is 2. No surprise over there. Now I'm going to say max with, a, let's say, a 4 and a 2. Well, clearly, the result is a 4. No surprise over there. But what if I say over here, max with a 4 and a 7 and a 2? Well, I'm passing three arguments, wherein I have given only two parameters, a and b, here. But when I run the code notice, it still gave us a value of 7. Now, how in the world can J JavaScript do that? Well, the reason is JavaScript treats you like a guest in its house. It doesn't yell at you and say, hey, you idiot, you shouldn't send 3 when 2 is expected. It'll quietly smile away and accept everything you give. Every function really is a var arg function in JavaScript. Actually, this is a little fooling example because notice that in this case it said 7 as an output, but if I send a 12 clearly that's broken, it's still sending a 7. So what's going on here? What's going on here is that every function is a var arg. So what you could do in the past was the following. You could write code like this. You could say, for example, uh, you know, a result is equal to arguments, if you will, 0. And then you could return the result when you're done with it. 
But within this, of course, you could write code like this far. You could say i is equal to 0, i less than arguments dot length. And then, of course, you could say i plus plus. And then you could say, for example, if result is less than arguments of i, then, of course, result is equal to arguments of i. And so, in other words, in the past, arguments was useful for representing variable arguments. So as you can see in this example, the result was a correct 12 because arguments represent. Now, there were a few problems with this code. The problem is a couple of things. The first problem, problem one is uh, how many parameters uh, does uh, parameters uh, does this function take? And, and the answer to that is who knows, right? Because you look at this, if it doesn't take any parameters, it could actually take a lot of parameters. How, what logic is that? How do you describe this to somebody and saying, this function doesn't take anything so you can send anything you want to it? That is, really doesn't make any sense at all. That's one problem. The second problem is, uh, what is arguments? Well, that's a very sad story. So arguments is uh, array uh, wannabe. So it was not an array. It died before it could become an array. So as a result, it just is longing to be an array, but it cannot use it as an array, which is really, really sad. Let's take a look at an example here. If I were to say, in this case, arguments uh, and say instance, uh, instance uh, of, let's say instance of, and then I say array, notice the false that you get as an output. So that's a really sad, isn't it? Because arguments is not an array, so you cannot use it as an array. So what do programmers normally do? They write code to forcefully convert arguments to an array, which really begins to uh, smell bad in the code. It's error prone, it's verbose, more coding to do. What is the answer? Good news, moving forward, quit using arguments. There should be no arguments about it. What you really want to use is the rest parameter. So how do you use a rest parameter? Notice, I'm going to start refactoring this code slowly to start using rest parameters. So the first thing I'm going to do here is put three dots. That's the ellipsis to say that this parameter is a rest parameter. And I'll call it as numbers right here. And notice now we are passing numbers, but it's been indicated as a rest parameter. What's the first benefit? The first benefit is when you look at this code, it is absolutely clear how many arguments you can pass to this. You can pass zero through any number of arguments because the ellipsis gives away that particular argument. The second thing is, if you look at this here, I'm going to ask for numbers instance of array. Notice false and true. While the arguments is not an array, numbers is actually an array. This opens up door for some really nice things you can actually do with this. So for example, I'm a huge fan of functional style of programming. Unfortunately, though, you cannot say arguments dot reduce. That is not a valid function. As you can see, it fails because reduce does not exist on arguments because arguments is not an array. On the other hand, you can do numbers.reduce. That is a function available. Undefined is not a function. Well, that, we'll come to that in a second. Numbers can be used with the reduce method very easily. So what is the model of the story? The model of the story is, while you could write code like this, you can actually start using numbers. In fact, let's do it this way. Let's go ahead and copy this over. So in this case, instead of using the arguments, the very first thing is it's easier to refactor the code. So notice everywhere I have arguments, I could use numbers right now. So it becomes a nice stand-in replacement for it right there. So I could actually use the numbers. But having done that, the, those two look extremely similar to each other. But I could actually go back to this code and say, well, return. And in this case, I can say numbers.reduce. And, and now I can provide a bunch of values for this. For example, I can say in this case, uh, given a max, we'll say result comma element, and then we can write it in a functional style, for example. And I can say if uh, result is greater than element, well, then return the result. 
otherwise returned the element, I can write this in a beautiful functional style, as you can see in this case. So that is not possible with the arguments, but we can do this nicely with the rest parameter. So that's one of the biggest benefits you get out of this is the rest parameter. So what's the model of the story? The model of the story is uh, the following. Uh, quit using, uh, so quit using arguments, instead, uh, instead use uh, rest, which is the dot, dot, dot. So that is a much better way to write code moving forward, is you want to use rest because A, it's descriptive, it's easy to see what you're passing, and B, the other benefit is you this uh, full-blown array, you can benefit from the methods of the array, you can write it imperatively, you can write it functionally, so that's one benefit you get out of using this, so that's a great benefit you get out of using the rest. But as a opposite to rest, you have what's called a spread operator. Let's take a look at the spread operator real quick. Let's take one example and play with it. Notice in this example, I called max with the values 4, 7, and 12. But on the other side, notice it's a rest parameter. What if I have the following? What if instead of this, I have a constant array is equal to, let's say, 1, 2, 3. And I want to call the function with the array. So what if I did the following? What if I said max and pass the array to it? Well, you clearly know this is not working properly because the result should have been a three, not the array one, two, three. So what just happened? What happened was it passed the entire array as one value to the numbers. If you ask the numbers what it contains, it contains one element, which is the entire array. That's not your intention. So what should you do instead of this? What you can do instead of this is you can call max and say array square bracket, and then you can pass a zero, and then of course you can say comma one, and then comma two, and now you can see the result is three. But if you write code like this, you will soon realize you need another job, right? This is not a fun way to write code. This is not going to be really fun at all. Imagine writing code like this for eight hours a day. You're not going to like the job anymore. So what do you do? Well, the good news is you don't need another job. You just need a better language. And JavaScript now provides that. So max over here, and then you can use the spread operator right there, and you can use the spread. So how do you know it's a rest or a spread? Notice the ellipsis being used here and the ellipsis being used here as well. If you use the ellipsis on the receiving side, it's the rest. If you use ellipsis on the sending side, it's a spread operator. But what is really cool about it is the spread is probably one of the coolest operators available in JavaScript. Let's explore this a little bit further. It is not just for rest on the other side. You can actually use it for discrete parameters as well. Let's look at an example. Let's say greet equals to function, and I'm taking name one and name two over here. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and print out, let's say, uh, you know, let's say hello, and then we'll put name one, and we will put name two right here. So this is a little function called greet that we wrote. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call greet with, let's say, uh, Jack comma Jill. And you can see that in this case, I can pass Jack and Jill to this function. But what if I had names equals to, let's say, Tom comma Jerry right here, and I want to be able to pass this to this function? Well, clearly, if you try to say uh, greet with names, that's not going to work really well. You have Tom, Jerry, and undefined, not quite what you really wanted. So what you really wanted was name square bracket 0, comma name square bracket 1, and that is also known as a sad pattern, right? So we don't want to do that. So what you can do instead is you can say greet, and then you can reuse the spread operator on it, and notice how beautiful that is in terms of how we can pass it. That becomes a lot easier to pass the data, so you can use a spread operator. Notice that you're using spread on this side, but you don't have rest on this other side, which is really powerful. You can use a spread anywhere you want to to take your collection and spread it. But what's really cool about the spread operator is you can combine arrays as well. So as an example, let's say you have names one, names two, names, let's say, others over here. So I'm going to have others. And in this case, I'm going to come in here and say others.join with a little comma. 
Well, if I run this code, you can see it's a Tom and Jerry so far. That's great. But what I can also do here is I can say, for example, constant, let's say, names one equals to, let's say, uh, Jack, comma, Jill. And then I'm going to say over here, oh, well, let's go ahead and say one more at this point. We'll say constant names two equals to, let's say, Tom and uh, Jerry. And we will also say, let's say, over here, uh, Spike. But notice what I can do now. I can call greet. But I can send to this, for example, names uh, two. Well, in this case, what is it going to do when I take the greet and pass names two to it? Well, you can see it said, hello, Tom, Jerry. Uh, we'll just say and so we can actually see the difference right here. And it says Tom, Jerry, and Spike. On the other hand, I can also say greet like this. But this time around, I'm going to say names one. But I'm going to go ahead and combine names one, and then I'm going to combine names two, and then I'm going to spread it out so I can actually pass all of that through. And that's pretty darn powerful, isn't it? You're able to combine two arrays together into one if you wanted to. But you can also go a little further if you wanted to. For example, you can say uh, greet, and then you can say uh, Bob, comma, Jane, for example, and then comma, and then you can say names, one, and you can combine it using that as well. So you can start combining them in any form or fashion, and you can put this together to communicate and, and, and combine uh, either an array of data or discrete values into it. You can do that as well. So for example, in this case, I can take Bob into a collection. I can then bring in names one into the collection. Then I can bring in Jane over here. And then I can also say, for example, uh, names two. And I can bring these together any form or fashion. So you can start combining them into this. So that is a powerful operation of spread. I'll show you one more power of spread later on, but it's by far one of the most charming operators I've actually come across in JavaScript. That's pretty darn wonderful. Well, we saw how we can qu quit using var and quit using constant as much as possible. We saw how to quit using arguments and start using rest and spread. Well, next let's talk about default parameters. Why do we care about default parameters? I take a slightly different view on this. One of the reasons I like a default parameter is not because you can send fewer parameters. I think it's really cool because you can easily extend your functions much more effectively. So to understand this, let's take a greet for a minute. And I'm going to take a name as an argument. And within this, I'm going to simply say over here, hello. And then I'm going to pass the name over here. Now I can call greet and say Joe right here. And it says, hello, Joe. But let's say a few weeks goes by, and you decide to change the function so that you can add uh, another parameter for the message. Well, unfortunately, that's a really hard now, because if you go back over here and say, oh, let's say message over here, and I'm going to change this to a message right here, the problem with this code is you can call greet right now. And for any new calls, you can pass the message, let's say, hi. But what about existing code that's already there? That's going to be broken. Joe is no longer happy with you because you said undefined Joe. So that's not going to be fun at all. What do we do? Well, the beauty is you can actually specify a default value for exactly that reason. It makes it really easy to extend existing methods. So for example, you can say hello right there. And you can see how you're able to bring that in, and you can use it. So this is one nice capability. You're able to bring that in. So if I say greet right here and only pass Jerry, you can see it says, hello, Jerry. But one of the really interesting features of the default parameters in JavaScript is not only can you use uh, a default parameter, but you can also go here and specify, if you will. Notice I'm going to change this a light slightly. And I'm going to put a little dollar. And I say name dot length, if you will. This is kind of weird, isn't it? 
This is how you can say high five to Jerry. So this is a nice way for you to actually use a parameter in a previous parameter that's there. You can use that. So this is really powerful, as you can see, where you can create this particular default value, but also combine it with expressions that are previously in the parameter list. Obviously, in this case, if you call greet with uh, Joe and say hello, you will not, of course, get that particular feature, but you can see in the other one, you're able to use that. So that's a pretty darn powerful feature, as you can see, within this particular default parameters. Well, having said that, though, we can use the def uh, defined parameters for it, but there is one difference we have to be very careful about. And when I show this to you, you probably will look at this and say, gosh, this is nasty, but there's a really good reason why they did it this way. So let's look at what that is. If I go back to this code now, notice I'm calling greet right now, and it said, hi fi Jerry. But if I call greet right now, and if I were to say in here, let's say Joe, but I'm going to pass a null to it. We know null is a smell. We shouldn't really do this. But what does it do? Well, it simply passes the null. So that's a little nasty. Don't send a null. Having said that, though, this is a little weird. If I send undefined right here, notice that it actually took the value, in this case, of the high as a parameter. So what's going on? Why is undefined so special? Well, there is a really good reason for this. The reason is, if you call a method or call a function, if it's returning an object to you, the object may not have certain properties. If the object doesn't have certain properties, those properties, if you try to access them, become as undefined. So the beauty is when you receive an object, you can start giving default values for properties that don't exist. I will show this to you towards the end of this presentation when I talk about destructuring, which is pretty amazing how destructuring and default and, uh, and spread all work together. That's really an awesome way to see the full power of the language. So we'll see this a little later on. Well, let's move a little forward. We talked about functions pretty much so far, but let's talk about looping values. So let's say we have, a, a, to begin with, let's start with names, if you will. So in this case, I say names equals to, uh, let's say Tom again and Jerry, and let's say Spike. And I want to iterate over these values. How do you do this in the old JavaScript? In the old JavaScript, you would say for var, and you would say i equal to 0, i less than names.length, i plus plus. And then you would say over here, output. Maybe you would say uh, something like i. And then you would provide a little dash over here. And then plus names square bracket i. Now, it worked, but nobody ever goes home proud after writing that code, isn't it? That's a really low-level code. It smells not very much fun and nothing to be proud about. Well, the code has to be a lot more concise than this. How can we really make that happen? Well, to do this, let's try the enhanced for loop. This is a much better way to write the loops. So for, and notice the beautiful word const over there. Now, this i is pretty dangerous. i is a variable. Nobody in the right mind would do it, but usually programmers are not always in the right mind. So we might actually try to change this, right? And as a result, that could be really a bad idea. Well, notice I put a word constant over here. That makes the looping really safe. So constant name, and the name is going to come from names over here. And I can simply print the name right here, as you can see. Notice it says Tom, Jerry, and Spike. That's awesome. That was really easy to write it. But I know what you're thinking. You're saying, all right, Venkat, that worked all right. But what about the 0, 1, and 2? I really wanted the indexing. Shouldn't I have access to that? Well, yeah, that would be really nice. Let's give it a try how to write it with the indexing. So what I'll do here is I'll say for constant index is equal to, well, actually, entry of, and we will say names dot entries, 
and we will call the entries method. And then what we will do here is we will simply print the entry out. Well, isn't that beautiful? So you're able to get the entry value out of it nicely. And as a result, you can see how it gave you an array of the entries. You're saying, all right, good first step, but I really want to get the index value separate from the value. How do you do that? Well, here's an idea. What we could do here is we could go back to this code and say, well, you give me the entry, and I'll say constant index is equal to entry square bracket 0, and constant name is equal to entry square bracket 1. And then we could output, of course, the uh, index value, and then a two dashes, and then the name. We could write it like this. But something tells me you're not convinced about it, right? Because this is a little verbose. You're writing three lines of code instead of writing one line of code. OK, fair enough. Here's another beautiful thing you can do. You can come to this code, and you can put a little square bracket, and then you can say comma name, and you can put the entry right here and remove this part. This is called destructuring. And destructuring is beautiful, as you can see. It's really saving you a little bit of an effort. But you realize, well, if you can do this, why not simply take this away from here and simply go up here and replace the entry? And that would work as well, as you can see right here. So that becomes a lot more elegant way to get the index out of it. So this is really applying two different concepts together. We are using the enhanced for loop on one hand, but we are also using the destructuring on the other hand as well. It's an interplay of two different concepts nicely working together here, and that makes life a lot easier, as you can see. So that's basically what we did. We kind of refactored this into using the destructuring. That's what we are doing at this point. So that's an enhanced for loop. But wait a minute. We're using a nice little enhanced for loop, but what in the world is names? Names is an array. An array is iterable, so we are able to use this very nicely. Well, but what if I want to use this for my own purpose, for my own class? So a class wheel is just going to represent the wheel of a car. Class car contains a constructor. And in this case, what I'm going to do is say this dot wheels is equal to. And I'm going to define a bunch of wheels over here. So we'll say new wheel right here. And we will create, let's say, four wheels for this particular car. So I created the four wheels of this car, as you can see. Now that I created four wheels, what I want to do is the following. I want to come in here and say constant car equals new car. So we create a new car object. Then I'm going to say for constant wheel of car. And then I want to print out the wheel right after this. So in this case, I want to just print out the wheel. Well, unfortunately, that doesn't work. Well, the reason it doesn't work is look at the error it gives you. It tells you that car is not iterable. Well, how do I make the car really iterable is the question. Well, this is where you can create this beautiful idea of generators and iterators very nicely. But before we talk about it, we have to talk about something else, so we'll come back to this. So in JavaScript, uh, if you think about primitives, JavaScript had five primitives in the past. So what were the primitives JavaScript had? It had number, it had a string, it had a Boolean, then it had a null and had an undefined. So these were the five primitives JavaScript had. Well, now JavaScript has six primitives. There is a new kid on the block, and the new kid on the block is actually called as symbol. So what is a symbol? A symbol is a representation of internal symbols in the language. If you use languages like Ruby, you're familiar with the idea of symbol. Not exactly the same, but a similar idea. So a symbol can give you uniqueness. Now, there can be several purposes of a symbol, but one purpose of symbol is, remember how JavaScript doesn't have interfaces. In, Java, in C Sharp and languages like uh, Java, you have concept of interfaces. Well, because JavaScript doesn't have interface, 
what if you want to tell somebody that they, they should implement your method called foo? Well, the problem is they may already have a method called foo, and how do you know if it is their method called foo or your method called foo? To make things worse, remember JavaScript doesn't have overloading of functions. So if they already have a function foo and you write a function called foo, there's going to be a collision between them. How do we deal with it? Well, JavaScript found a way to deal with this. Rather than introducing interfaces, they decided to introduce unique method names. And so because symbols are unique, method names that have symbol in their name are unique. So one such symbol is called symbol uh, dot iterator. So the iterator is a special function. And because it's a symbol, it is unique. JavaScript will look for a function with that name in your object. And if your object contains that function, that means your function, your object is iterable. If your object doesn't have that function, your object is not iterable. Well, that's exactly what we're going to use over here to perform the iteration on our object. So notice when I run the code, it said that car is not iterable. So what am I going to do now? I'm going to go back over here, and I'm going to write a sys symbol dot iterator, and I'm going to provide a special function called the iterator function. I won't have time to go into the depth of this, but I will give you a clue, and then we'll switch to something a little simpler. I'm going to simply say called over here right now. So when I run this code, notice at the top it says called, and the reason it says called over there is it looked at the symbol.iterator and said, aha, you are supporting an iterator. Thank you so much. I'm going to call it. If you want to implement an iterator for yourself, the syntax can become really ugly and nasty. Only a few people in the world have survived the journey. Well, thankfully, you don't have to fight that hard. You can do a lot better. But before I show you what you can do, how many of you are familiar with C Sharp in the room? Just a quick show of hands. Awesome. How many of you are uh, 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 familiar with Ruby, for example? A few hands, uh, hands go up. Well, both Ruby and C Sharp have this keyword called yield. Well, that's exactly what you're going to use. If you understand what yield does in Ruby, that's exactly what yield does in C Sharp. That's exactly what yield does in JavaScript. So notice what I'll do here. I'm going to say over here, called over here. And then I'm going to say yield, just say a nasty one for now. What is it going to do? Well, first of all, I'm using the yield, but you cannot just use yield anywhere you want to. I mentioned that there's a really ugly syntax. Most people don't survive it. Well, if you're writing that ugly syntax, you're going to write a lot of code here. You can tell JavaScript compiler, you know what? I don't want to go through the journey. Why don't you do the work for me? Well, for that, you have to bribe JavaScript just a little bit. And the bribe you give is called this asterisk. So you cannot use yield in a function that's not marked with an asterisk. So they go as, as buddies. They always are there together. So now that I put an asterisk over there, notice it's returning a value of 1. It said called, and it returns 1. Now notice, I'm going to change this to called 1, if you will. And then I'm going to repeat this right here. And I'll call this as called 2 and return a 2. Notice how it says called 1 and called 2. If you're used to yield in C sharp, this is exactly how C sharp yield works as well. So as you can see here, as you're looping through here, it first comes in the iterator, calls the called 1, returns 1, goes back to the iteration here, but then quietly comes back and resumes over here without re-entering the particular function. So this is like a coroutine, if you will. It jumps right in the middle of that code and executes until the next yield. And then you can see that it goes further down and yield 3 right here. And you can see, in this case, this is uh, called 3. And just for our purpose, I'm going to say in loop right here. So you can see how that's actually going through in the loop, iterating over the uh, concepts of yield versus the looping. It's able to do this. We can leverage this, re leverage this really nicely now. Notice what I'm going to do here. Well, first of all, I'm interested in iterating over the wheels, after all. So I can say far constant wheel of this dot wheels. And then I can simply say over here, 
uh, yield, and then I can yield the wheel to the caller. So in this case, you can see that we are getting one wheel at a time from the call, and that is the four wheels of the car we are able to get to it. But actually, you can do a lot better than this. This is where the power of yield really comes in. Rather than doing it this way, when would you write code like this? If you want to control your own iteration, you want to write code like this. However, you can also do yield, and then you can simply say this dot wheels over here, and you can also convert a collection and yield over the collection as well, and that is pretty darn powerful, as you can see. This gives a nice way to generate uh, data from your collection. Well, that's great so far, but what if I want to iterate over wheels, and I want to iterate over doors, I want to iterate over seats, what have you? Well, this, of course, is not going to help us because the symbol.iterator gives one iteration over the collection. You want multiple types of iterators. What gives? Well, here comes the beauty. You can simply go to this code, and you can say wheels over here. Let's call this as the wheels for to avoid confusion. So the wheels, and I simply come down here and say the wheels, and notice how, in this case, the wheels can be the function that I can start iterating over here in this code for the iteration purpose, and I can start doing that very nicely, as you can see right here. So in this case, as you see, the wheels is a function, but I turn the function into a generator by sprinkling a star in front of it, and as a result, that becomes a generator function. As a result, I can have yet another function called the doors, if you will, and the doors can do whatever it wants to do. If you want to iterate over doors, you can call the doors, iterate over the wheels, you can call the wheels, and so on. So this becomes a really nice way for you to use this generator. And so not only can you use an elegant for loop, you can also use elegant for loop on your own classes as well by implementing nice little generators. Well, the next thing I want to talk about is um, uh, arrow functions. We'll talk about the structure of arrow functions, and then we'll talk about some gotchas with it. Let's say we have a greet is equal to function. In this case, I'm going to take a name over here as a parameter, and then, of course, I'm going to say, let's say, hello, dollar name right here. In this case, I can call greet and pass Jane over here, and you can see that it says, hello, Jane. Well, this is a regular function I've written right here. But what I can do here is we can use an arrow function. So let's talk about arrow function. Arrow function structure is as follows. You have a parenthesis, parameter list, a fat arrow, as they ca call it. And then, of course, this is the same as you use in C sharp. And then you write a single line body of the function. And so this becomes the structure of an arrow function. Now, the parenthesis is optional, so is optional if the parameter list has only one parameter. So if you don't have any parameter or you have more than one, you're required to put a parenthesis. But if you don't have anything other than one parameter, you can let go of it. So how do we write this in here? Constant greet is equal to name arrow. And then I can simply say uh, over here, output hello, and then a dollar name, as you can see. So we are using an arrow function rather than writing a, a regular function. So this becomes a very concise way of writing the code. But unfortunately, though, this is easy said than done. The problem is you cannot just simply use an arrow function anywhere there is a function. That's a really a slippery slope. We're going to get hurt if you do that. Well, why is that such a big problem? For this, we have to understand the scoping. Now, let's talk about scoping. Let's say, uh, you know, kind languages use what is called lexical scoping. So what is lexical scoping? Lexical scoping is where you can eyeball the code, uh, eyeball uh, the code uh, uh, to find uh, variables uh, to bind to. This is a very easy way to think about it. You can just eyeball the code and say, oh, look, the code is here. I'm going to look around. That's a variable I'm going to use. That's lexical scoping. Now, uh, on the other hand, 
uh, hard languages, uh, languages. Uh, so what do they do? Use dynamic scoping. So what is dynamic scoping? Uh, a variable uh, is bound to what the caller sends. Well, this is really hard. Why? Because you don't know who the caller is when you look at the code. When they send the data, they send you the uh, uh, value to bind to. Now, then comes along uh, evil languages use both lexical scoping uh, and dynamic scoping. Is anyone aware of such an evil language? <laughs> right? So this is why JavaScript is pure evil. Because it uses both lexical scoping and dynamic scoping. We got to be extremely careful about this. So let's understand why this is a big deal. To understand this, let's take a look at an example of a function which is going to use multiple different scopes in here so we can appreciate this a little bit better. So what I'm going to do here is create a constant greet is equal to, let's go ahead and say function name. We'll call this as greet1. Actually, let's call it as f1. And I'm going to pass a value n to this. And I'm going to just print the value n. Now I'm going to say constant f1 is equal to n. And then I'm going to, over here, print the value of n. Notice that f1 and f2 are very similar to each other in what they do. But one is written as a regular function. The other is returned as uh, 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 an arrow function. Now I'm going to call f1 with a 7. I'm going to call f2 with a 7. No surprises over here. Both of them are the parameters being passed in. However, there's something we need to keep in mind. Uh, a, a regular function, regular and anonymous functions uh, use lexical scoping for all non-parameters except uh, this and arguments. This is one of the really sad stories about how JavaScript works. JavaScript uses lexical scoping for everything except for this and arguments. So as a result, as you can see here, I'm going to say this dot something is equal to 4. Now I come in here and say this dot something. And the same thing I'm going to do over here as well, but we'll do that in just a minute. Now notice in here, I'm going to go ahead and call this with the function f1. We know what n is. It's a local variable. But what is this? Unfortunately, this is dynamically scoped. So when I run this code, it says undefined. The reason it says undefined is that the f1 is going to receive the this. So if I said over here, uh, let's say for a minute, if I were to say over here, um, f1 uh, dot call, and I'm going to say something, uh, aha, and then I pass the value of 7. Notice in the second call over here, it actually says, aha. And the reason is the caller sends the this as a parameter to that function, which is pretty sad, as you can see right here. So in this case, this and arguments are going to use, so what do the this and arguments do? This and arguments use dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, scoping, right? So this is basically how this works. This is dynamic scoping, uh, if I know how to type that. So dynamic scoping is what they use for this and arguments. On the other hand, uh, arrow functions use lexical scoping for all uh, non-parameter uh, uh, parameters. So they consistently use lexical scoping for everything. So as a result, semantically, they are very different from one another. As you can see in this example, if I go back to this code, and if I take this one and put it into F2, when I run the code, notice F2 says 4 and not uh, undefined in the first place. In fact, if you go back over here and say F2.call, and I say something, and then aha, uh, and then, of course, comma 7. Well, guess what? It makes no sense to use call on this. It will not use aha, because 
the disk is never bound by an arrow function. So what's the model of the story? The model of the story is uh, uh, know the semantics, uh, a semantical uh, difference, right? A uh, difference between, uh, between arrow functions and non-arrow functions. So that's the first thing. The second thing to keep in mind is, given this, arrow functions uh, use a, le a lexical scope. So uh, for all variables that are not parameters. So let's infer something from that. Uh, it makes zero sense to use arrow function as a method of a class. Just think about that for a minute, right? Why would you ever want to do that? Because if you make an arrow function a method of a class, that this will be bound to whatever is outside of the class. And so when you call the method, the object will not be bound to the object on which the method is attached to. It will be something else. It makes no sense to do that. So just because arrow functions are cute doesn't mean we use them all the time. We have to really understand the semantical difference between an arrow function and a regular function. Otherwise, we'll get really hurt by it. So we have to be very careful about it. I want to show you three other concepts before we are done here. And, and this is uh, by far a, a pretty nice, interesting feature that JavaScript has added. And that is template literals. You saw me do this already. So what you can do here is, suppose you had a constant name equals to uh, Jane. Well, you could write code like this. You could say hello, and then plus, and then you could say name like this. But this is so boring. Well, instead of doing it this way, you could actually do a back tick hello dollar name, and you can write a template literal. Notice carefully the back tick. Why a back tick? Well, the single quote and double quote already have meaning in JavaScript. They are just literals. They cannot change the rule of the game suddenly because backward compatibility is very important for Java. So uh, JavaScript. So as a result, they said we're going to use a new symbol called a back tick. This becomes what's called a template literal, and as a result, you can embed expressions in here. For example, hello name is of length, for example, name.length, as you can see, and you're able to write it that way as well. So you can see that you are able to use the expressions here as well, and you can use these things called the template literal. But I'm going to show you an object literal, and when I show this to you the way I'm going to show it to you, you probably will get angry, as I did. But there's a really good use for it in destructuring, so we'll talk about that after I show you the nasty code. Let's say for a minute, I have a constant, the name equal to Sam right here. I also have a constant, the age is equal to two. Now I want to say a constant Sam equal to name colon the name, and then age colon the age. So this shouldn't be of any surprise at all to you. So I'm printing Sam right here. Well, this is great. But then notice, I could just use age over here. Then I could use age over here. And when I run the code, it works. But what is this we are dealing with right now? This age is a property. This age is a local variable. This is where an object literal comes in. If the name of the property is the same as the name of a local variable, you can quietly omit that and write the code like this. So this becomes a really e easy way to take objects and create them from existing variables. So similarly, if this was called as name, I can call this as name as well. Or what I can do here is I can quietly remove this part, and I can write the code like this. So the key here is you should really watch out for this curly that is sitting right here. Now, given this, this is object literal you're constructing. There is also what is called destructuring. Before we talk about destructuring, I want you to look at that word, structuring. Let's change the word structuring to something else. Let's call it construction. What is construction? Construction is where you create an object from data. 
Well, structuring or construction is you create an object from data. Deconstruction or destructuring is the reverse of it. You create variables from an object. So notice what I'm going to do here. I'm going to take this object, and in this case, let's take the SAM object, if you will, and let's say the SAM object contains the name called the SAM, and we also have an age, let's say, is 2. But I want to get this variable back from the caller. How do I do that? So notice I can say constant. And in this case, I can say the name equal to sam.name. I can say constant the age equal to sam.age. Then I can print out here, well, the name. And then I can also print out the age as well. This is an old style boring code. We can write it like this. But I realize quickly. If I'm all that I'm doing is destructuring, why can't we do this a little bit more elegantly? So notice constant. What is the name of the variable? The name. But where does the value come for it? From the name, if you will. And similarly, the age is a property. The age is a variable equal to SAM. I'm able to do destructuring at this point. Now, if the syntax is a little confusing, I'll give you a clue to make it a bit easier for you. Rather than seeing this as an assignment, look at this as pattern matching. What does that really mean? You're saying, on the right side, I have name colon Sam, and I also have age colon uh, two. Now apply pattern matching. Name, name, Sam, the name, aha, I'm going to assign the name to Sam. Age is age, the age is two. So this is a pattern matching. That's what you're really doing in this case. So you are saying, look what's on the right and look what's on the left. And whatever is common, keep it. Whatever is defined here as a variable, what is a constant over here, literal over here, assigned to it as a pattern matching. So that is basically what's happening in the syntax is a pattern matching. Now, why is this such a cool thing? The reason this is a cool thing is, I'll show you one more thing, what you can do with this. Now let's write a function called uh, printed. Now the printed function says person, and within this function, what am I going to do? Let's say we have a height, and uh, let's say height is 100, whatever that means. But I'm going to say print out. We could say person's name is, and then I'm going to say uh, person.name. Uh, and let's say name, and then we'll say and age is, and then we'll say person dot age. If you look at this code real quick right here, this is using the person's name and person's age. No surprise over there. Now what I'm going to do here is, in this case, I'm going to call print it and pass Sam to it. While that worked, the person's name is Sam and age is two. But notice, I don't care about height. I don't care about weight, whatever that value is. It doesn't really matter to me. But what I'm really looking for is name and age. If that's all I want, here's uh, what I can do, right? Constant name is equal to person dot name, OK? And then constant age is equal to person dot age, OK? Now I can use a name here. I can use an age here. Well, only a little bit better. It removes the clutter just a little bit. Oh, wait a minute. We could use object destructuring, isn't it? So why not simply say over here, constant name comma age is equal to person. That, that would really eliminate that ugly syntax after all. Well, wait a minute. If you can do that, why not just elevate this all the way up to here, isn't that beautiful? So you can actually do the destructuring on entry to the parameter. So what this says is, when an object is being passed on the other side, just take the name and age alone, leave out the rest of the things. That is destructuring right there when you are receiving the data. Just like I did, how I refactored it through some stages, it becomes really easy to understand. If you go through the steps of refactoring it, that really ties the idea in our mind really well. 
where we are just saying, extract the name, extract the age, and leave out the height and weight or other properties, I don't care about it. And I'll show you one last thing before we are done with this. Notice in here, I'm going to print out Sam. Now I want to create an older Sam is equal to, now I say name is Sam.name, age is Sam dot, uh, age plus one, height is Sam dot height, and weight is Sam dot weight. This is also known as bad idea, isn't it? Why is this such a bad idea? Well, notice in here, Sam is the same as Sam was before. We are not mutating Sam, which is a good news. But unfortunately here, notice that in this particular case, I had to copy every single property in here. So the age is going to be Sam.age plus one, and so on. This is a sad story, isn't it? The age is different, everything else is the same. Why is this a bad idea? Well, tomorrow, Sam gets a Facebook ID or a Twitter account, right? So in this case, you're going to say whatever Sam's ID is. Now the code is broken, isn't it? Because you have to come here and say, comma, Twitter is equal to Sam.Twitter. Nobody wants to write code like that. That's stupid, isn't it? Well, the good news is you don't have to. What you can do instead is you can simply come here and say the age is different. And I've seen this uh, facility in languages like Elm, for example. So what you can do here is you can simply say Sam, comma. So notice how beautifully you are using the spread operator to copy everything from the object. You probably have seen this in Redux. Redux uses this quite a bit to make copies of objects. And, and the spread operator is beautiful in here, where you can simply say, take everything from Sam and only give me a new value for age. And so as a result, the height and weight and the name all got copied over pretty nicely. So the good news is modern JavaScript is a lot better than the JavaScript that tormented once, uh, us once upon a time. A lot of beautiful features. They introduced these from different languages, like, for example, parts of C Sharp, Ruby, Python, uh, Java. So many features in so many different languages have influenced this. And I think they have done a remarkable job. So if you're interested in the code examples, you can download them from my website. If you're interested in the book I mentioned, feel free to take a look at that as well. Hope that was useful. Thank you.